Rapport with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Wednesday, December 14th, 2022. My name is Emma Vigeland, in for Sam Cedar, and this is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, Jamie McCallum, professor of sociology at Middlebury College and author of Essential, how the pandemic transformed the long fight for worker justice. Later in the program, Garrett Bruhag, a PhD candidate at the University of Rochester, will be joining us to explain the latest breakthrough in fusion energy and what it really means. Meanwhile, Biden officially signed the Respect for Marriage Act into law yesterday, mandating federal recognition of same-sex and interracial marriage and protecting couples from Supreme Court extremism. Senator Bernie Sanders withdrew a vote on his Yemen War Powers Resolution after clashing with the Biden administration, who thought the vote would complicate diplomacy with Saudi Arabia. Yeah, they're the brutal regime conducting this proxy war. We'll talk about that more in a bit. Despite indicators all pointing towards inflation subsiding, the Fed has decided on its seventh rate hike of 2022. Smaller than before, but still, the contraction is inevitable. And the point. The framework for the government funding bill has been agreed to by top negotiators. It's expected to be done by December 23rd. Trump and Marjorie Taylor Greene are lobbying on Kevin McCarthy's behalf, reports indicate, whose path to a successful leadership vote has become a bit more rocky. With a surge of migrants crossing the border, the Biden administration is reportedly moving to expand a program creating a legal process for Venezuelan, Cuban, Haitian, and Nicaraguan migrants to seek asylum ahead of the expiration of Title 42. Although, it's like a side program meant to dissuade them from coming across the border. We'll discuss that more in the program. The U.S. is set to approve the sending of its most advanced ground air defense system to Ukraine. Tesla's shares have fallen by over a quarter since Elon Musk acquired Twitter, and investors are voicing some concern. In Iran, 400 have been sentenced to up to 10 years in prison for protesting. And lastly, outgoing Oregon Governor Kate Brown has announced that she will commute the sentences of all 17 individuals on Oregon's death row to life in prison sentences, which is admirable. Good on Kate Brown. All this and more on today's Majority Report. Welcome to the show, everybody. As a reminder, Sam is out this week, cruising around somewhere on the globe. Um, Gilligan out there. Yep. Uh... (laughs) That beard is going to be... I mean, be... we haven't heard from him, so... We have we not. I, we, I figured if he was having a bad time, we'd hear I'll some I'll send complaint. you some dispatches. Right. So maybe he's having a really nice time. Maybe he's going to be a cruise guy from here on out. The collared shirts turn to ones with Hawaiian flowers on them. Double fistine sort of coconut, uh, hollowed out coconut born margaritas. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, there's like a 30 Rock episode about that brand of people. They're called the Crab Catchers. He's going to move to Central Florida and just live the good life. Hey, I've actually, uh, my grandparents uh, took me on a cruise about a decade ago, and um, 
The Cayman Islands Margaritaville. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what more can you ask for, really? Um, so uh, he will be back next week. But uh, we have two guests today. I thought it was important to have someone who actually is scientifically literate to speak on uh, the breakthrough in, nu- in, in fusion power, um, which looks incredibly exciting on its surface, and it is in terms of the technological achievement, but... We need someone to put into perspective how far along some of this science might be and what some of the uh, obstacles might be as well. Um, but first, I want to talk about the uh, uh, this Yemen uh, war powers controversy. So Ryan Grimm yesterday was doing um, a lot of reporting and updates on the Biden administration and their opposition to Bernie Sanders's war powers resolution that was coming to a vote in the Senate, they were expected to vote yesterday night. That did not happen. The White House didn't want to publicize that they were privately urging senators to vote against Bernie Sanders's Yemen war powers resolution, but that was the case. And their, their argument was that a vote to uh, curb the United States' support for the war in Yemen, which, by the way, has killed over 11,000 children that we know about, and it's a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and the Yemeni people are being used as human sacrifices, essentially, for a war between those two powers in that region with our tax dollars benefiting it. Um, the, the, they were essentially saying that um, despite the ceasefire essentially lapsing, um, also because the United Nations brokered peace has expired, that the war powers resolution would increase the likelihood of more violence, which is not the case, but they have to kind of position themselves in that way. This is a White House um, spokesperson, or I should say press secretary, Karine Jean-Pierre, being asked specifically about the updates in this instance. This was before Bernie Sanders actually had to, or chose to withdraw the war powers resolution um, on the urging of the Biden administration. We can discuss if that was a smart choice or a good one uh, after these comments. Uh, okay. Um, is the White House whipping against Senator Bernie Sanders' war powers resolution that's set for a vote in the Senate tonight? Uh, look, we've spoken to this uh, before. I don't have anything much more to add. I know my colleagues actually was asked this question uh, last week. Don't have anything more to really uh, uh, discuss or lean into on this. Bernie Sanders just said that he's dealing with White House opposition to it right now, so we're just hoping for a confirmation of what all is going on there. Uh, so look, uh, I'll say this. We're in touch with members of Congress uh, on this. Thanks to our diplomacy, which remains uh, ongoing and delicate, the violence over nearly nine months has uh, effectively stopped. Uh, as we have seen during this administration, the situation is still fragile and our diplomatic efforts are ongoing. So we want to make sure that this is not impacted and the people of Yemen uh, do not suffer or that any of the progress we have made is overturned. Uh, again, I, I really don't want to get ahead of the, the progress. We continue to work uh, with Congress on this. We're having the conversations. I just don't want to get ahead of that. It sounds like you might be that if it comes to uh, I'm, just, I'm just not going to uh, make a prediction. I'm certainly not going to make a prediction of what the president is going to do, is not going to do. Uh, we're having conversations uh, with uh, members of Congress and uh, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks, everybody. Mm. Reading very carefully from her notes at one point, um, the reality was that, yes, the Biden administration was whipping votes against this resolution. The reason that they don't want to say that is because, one, it's unconscionable, (laughs) and two, it is in direct contradiction with their attempt at a public posture on this. Uh, Biden, the officials that now populate the Biden administration had signed a letter. There were two separate letters, one signed actually by current CIA director Avril Haines and Secretary of State uh, Blinken in 2018 in opposition to the war in Yemen. And then one in 2019, which included uh, Susan Rice, Jake Sullivan, 
other people within the Biden administration, essentially saying that Donald Trump, um, his veto of the Yemen war powers resolution was they were opposed to it. And now they're trying. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Avril Haines, uh, director of national intelligence, not CIA. I apologize. I misspoke. Um, uh, that the, uh, that opposition, they, now that they're in power, essentially, they have changed their position entirely because this is an almost identical situation. Except now the Biden administration is worried and being held hostage once again by Saudi Arabia when it comes to gas prices and price gouging. That's why Biden had to go and fist pump, bump MBS. But also the thing that that I think is mostly driving this is the Biden administration wants these kinds of decisions to be at their discretion and not at the discretion of Congress. Um, the The war powers resolution would would uh, claw back the White House's basically ability to unilaterally make these decisions and they would have to go through Congress. And that is, I think, the precedent that they are afraid of. Uh, a, a few years ago, months ago, the Biden administration announced that they were going to end all support for offensive operations by Saudi Arabia and Yemen, which was essentially not uh, not uh, didn't have any teeth. To they it define it all because, as defense. Well, they, everything is defensive. Our drone strikes where we kill innocent people are defensive. Israel's operations where they kill children in palestine that's defensive anything can be classified as defensive and so we have had, the biden administration issued a press release saying we're ending our support for offensive operations and hey the reality is that we just do it a little bit more secretly I our mean, support for this unconscionable war what are you saying about like that limits our diplomacy well it's like it limits you using war <laughs> um uh, as part of that diplomacy um and puts that back in the uh, takes it out of the executive branch's um, exclusive purview. That's what they're afraid of. They want it to be, well, we can make tweaks, but still, this should be um, this should be our choice. And talk about like what the founding fathers intended. This is in direct contradiction to that. These kinds of decisions were supposed to have the check of Congress, uh, the, the check uh, uh, of of that branch of government. Um, and Bernie Sanders choosing to withdraw this at the urging of the White House, despite the fact that he had been getting significant bipartisan support, and it might have still failed. I mean, he, but but there were some Republicans in the House who indicate that they might support it. And then you had Mike Lee, who's, who was uh, on board with this as well. So there was a path forward, potentially. But Bernie Sanders essentially took the word of the Biden administration and said, I'm going to withdraw this so as to not create tension. And then we'll work together behind the scenes to end Yemen, uh, our, our support for the war in Yemen. But why would you take their word for it based on what I literally just described, which is that they made a big announcement about how they were ending off a support for offensive operations and in terms of substance that meant nothing we're still doing it we're still doing it i mean the irony is um despite what sort of anti-bernie people think he's a party man <laughs> he i mean he he didn't want to ruffle feathers on this instance and and he has a relationship with biden he chose to make this decision um and maybe the vote would have failed because of the of um sure how the how the white house was whipping votes i still think you go Let ahead with it yeah. It's still you think, and, and I'm wondering what Chuck Schumer's role in this as well. well um, it was probably as a proxy for the Biden the administration, House, yeah. but in terms of whipping votes, like he might have gotten enough, and so Biden, or Bernie might have not want wanted to see it fail essentially. Um, and but like Saudi Arabia, the, the the idea that we're just going to appease them <laughs> and bow down to whatever this like spoiled brat MBS wants in order to not ruffle his feathers because there might be some domestic opposition in the United States to supporting a, uh, a hor horrific war 
that we have no stake in and people see the photos of starving and dead children and say this is not something that we want our tax dollars funding that that's enough to ruffle that guy's feathers should be a sign that we need to end this relationship and move towards different energy sources as we begin our transition uh, away, uh, towards green energy. I just really, really pretty gross display of hypocrisy by the Biden administration. And they tried to be subtle about it by whipping votes behind the scenes. Good on our friend Ryan Grimm for reporting all of this. Um, otherwise, we would we might have not known. I mean, there are certain things like um, discouraging a coup <laughs> against Lula, um, for instance, that the Biden administration is good on. But overall, it's a very, very dark um, uh, uh, record uh, beginning to form or forming. Um, the we, we talked about like the failure to move uh, on the Iran deal early on. Um, also, the failure to renormalize with Cuba. Um, the way Obama had. Um, there's still sanctions there that's still starving people um, and causing massive um, uh, sort of want there. And and this, and like Blinken sucks. <laughs> Blinken, and it's, like, it's, it's like you, you want more latitude for the diplomacy you've been demonstrating? No. Why Blinken does suck is that for, for the reason you, you describe, but too, like a normalizing force when it comes to United States diplomacy, after so much was clawed back with reckless abandon by the Trump administration is not enough. Yeah. You, there has to be restoration, not just stabilization, <laughs> because then you're just continuing what, what, what was destroyed. And that's the problem with actually like Republicans getting in office is this is the class of Democrats that we have. And when they get back into office, they can pick and choose what they want to mm -hmm. restore and what they want to stabilize and what they want to completely ignore and um, put in their back pocket, like Title 42, for instance. Exactly. All right. We are going to take a quick break. We first have a word from one of our sponsors, and you will hear Sam Cedar uh, deliver this message to you. Be right back. Hey, folks. Uh, one of our sponsors today is also Great Gift Alert. IAC Laser Engraving. It's a leftist owned worker collective started by a longtime listener of this program, a guy named Ryan Lubin. Started back uh, over a year ago now, September of 2021. His company is democratically structured. They ensure any hierarchies are justified and efficient. They use sustainably sourced materials. They couple them with extremely energy efficient laser technology, and they bring you really super unique products that you're not going to find anywhere else. Uh, so not only does your uh, purchase of their items get you a one-of-kind product, also goes to directly supporting a business model that's structured around compassionate and worker-centered care as opposed to the more traditional authoritarian capitalist structure. But let's get right to the uh, uh, the gifts here. Um, they have all sorts of, uh, of stuff that is really incredibly impressive. Um, I've talked about the, uh, the, the uh, astronaut that Saul is going to get. Well, here, check this out. This is a owl they have these in two different sizes uh they hang right up on your wall like that um and you can see there this is made out of i think at one point like nine different layers so it's it's 3d in many respects um and it's so cool uh precision crafted again different sizes if you want um here is a um this one's like a, a, Scos a sasquatch or what else do you call it a yeti it's got Big yetis foot. inside, Bigfoot, and it's got multiple ones in there. It's a cool thing. You hang on your wall. You put it on your kid's uh, table. You know, it stands right, right up there. You can't see that. stands right up there on your microphone stand. Again, this is made from sustainable materials. Uh, this one's got eight layers, and you can see that. It's really uh, beautiful stuff. This one is incredibly impressive, and this one also comes in two different sizes. Oh. Oh, oh, here we go. This is a um, uh, a turtle. It's gorgeous. This is really beautiful. And you can hang it this way. You can hang it that way. Uh, two different sizes. Again, multi-layered, uh, sustainable materials. They also have picture frames, beautiful picture frames made in the same way. They also have um, puzzles. They have uh, a, a bunch of different puzzle sizes. Um, and they can also do custom puzzles. And this is really a great gift for the holidays and also for like an anniversary or something like that, where uh, you send in a photo 
It's for a little bit more than the existing puzzles sent in. They'll do a custom uh, version of that. They'll do the, uh, you know, custom sizes. Um, really beautiful stuff. Check it out. Um, visit IACLasers.com. Orders your, order yours today and enter in the coupon code MAJORITY10 at purchase, and you get a 10% discount on their amazing products. Again, that's IAC Lasers. One word, IACLasers.com. And then you coupon code MAJORITY10, you get 10% off. Uh, really great stuff. Great uh, business model and um, just fantastic gifts. So check it out. And now... We'll, of course, put that link in our YouTube and podcast description. Now, back to Emma. Emma? Back. We are back. And uh, we are joined now by Jamie McCallum, professor of sociology at Middlebury College and author of Essential, How the Pandemic Transformed the Long Fight for Worker Justice. Jamie, uh, thanks so much for coming on today. Thanks for having me. Of course. So the 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 pandemic really births, I would say, the wide uh, use of the term essential worker, and that's a broad umbrella term for nurses, medical workers, but to grocery workers, retail workers, as you describe. And they were essentially like the people that we needed to keep our society going during the pandemic. But that necessity was not translated beyond applause <laughs> uh, to, toward, to recognition in, in the form of pay. Um, I mean, that, that, let's just start there because that is the, the foundation of what you write about. Right. Yeah. So the people I talked to, I talked to about 100 essential workers in a million different industries. And um, their main concern was that the public pl applause and adulation and respect was never translating into some really material benefit. <laughs> and so they felt both happy that for once, like essential workers had always been there. They were always around, they're still around. Uh, we just gave them a new name for a couple of years. And during that time, a lot of them were proud of that, you know, adage or that name. But, you know, really there was a moment of cognitive dissonance when it did not really amount to any sort of real significant transformation in their lives well they were called heroes and then they were left to die <laughs> that yeah. that was the reality yeah exactly so the hero worship thing was pretty interesting the book starts in new york where i talked to nurses who were walking into um their hospital while applause is happening knowing full well that like the you know members of the public the government is not doing what it has to do to keep cases down and there is a real a real tension there between that sort of respect and that you know on, on the one hand then la or sort of celebrity status but then lack of real respect you know heroes superheroes by definition don't need protections they don't need um government programs to help them out. They don't need a better boss. They definitely don't need a union. They just rise above the fray, right? And so in, so in naming people heroes, I think we sort of, you know, undermined the necessity to really do right by them. Right. And I mean, that is what, <laughs> I have a per uh, particular allergy to performative actions, but that I think is what stuck in my craw uh, most of all about about the applause uh, i mean i'm here in new york and and um i couldn't really put my finger on why it bothered me so much um but yeah. I, I, I like what you also discussed was uh and it, it the expansion of, of, cl of the classification of ex essential workers as well right which is that yes you spoke to those those nurses people who experienced the front lines there but there were also people on the front lines who were deemed essential workers and there was no real reason for it like walmart readers you talk about um, right yeah yeah so who who amounted to an essential worker was very capricious and it it changed city to city town to town state to state um you know neighborhood to neighborhood at times so one chapter starts off with a woman um who was a walmart greeter and who was deemed essential during the pandemic she passed away, so I interviewed her, her mother. Um, 
And a lot of people began to ask, well, why, why is it important that someone says, you know, welcome to Walmart every time you, 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 you enter in the middle of the largest health crisis in a century? There were other people like, you know, elite fly fishing guides in Montana were deemed essential because they're essential to the tourist economy um, in the summer of that state. <laughs> and um, so there was a lot of, you know, politicking and lobbying behind the scenes to get one's business either considered essential or not. The other thing was is that some workers were deemed essential in some jobs while they were working in the front lines, but not in others. So I interviewed people who worked in fast food jobs who are universally, were universally, they're just like the lowest rung of the employment spectrum in America. Yet when they worked in, in the same, on the same day, their next shift was as a nursing aide. People were like, oh my God, you're an essential hero, right? Yet they were, they were, they were working at the same, at the same time. And so I think that speaks to the kind of subjective nature of what that designation really was. I mean, there's so within this classification of essential worker, there's such a broad range of workers, as you discuss, like those examples that you gave and and they're being put unnecessarily in harm's way because they are essential to capitalism, kind of like continuing to function in a certain at a certain level of of profitability or viability for uh, for, for people at the top. And then there's essential workers working at, in like at deemed heroes in hospitals and in healthcare facilities and they are but that what they receive is recognition as a replacement for compensation i mean and that is that that's the story of, of workers in the pandemic or, or part of it of course that that's part of the story yeah we need a new definition of what workplace heroism looks like I think because people do, I mean, people did and do perform heroic acts that save people's lives. Uh, not all of it was just showing up day after day at your drudgery job. Like we needed nurses on picket lines. We needed home care aides at the bargaining table. We needed teachers in the streets demanding that their families were priorities for vaccines. Like they performed all these heroic acts that are largely considered disruptive to the status quo that really actually mattered quite a bit. And I think that kind of heroism was, has largely been forgotten to a large extent. Definitely. I mean, beside for, for the la the uh, other essential workers, like the Walmart greeters and the, the tour guides that you describe, like what's your sense of what the point of that was uh, besides one, keeping the economy going, but part of it to me feels like it, it, there's a labor discipline element to it as well, which is that mm. um, we're not going to let you sit on your ass. You're going to expose yourself for, because this is what our society is built on. You are supposed to be coming to work and there certain people can stay home and work from home, but not your class of people. Right. Exactly. There is we prioritized the business culture of the largest employers. That's basically what some of essential work was again, as you said, completely necessary. Some of it, we just prioritized the sort of social and cultural habits and norms of large employers. If Walmart needs someone to say that when you walk in, then we're going to have someone to do that, right? If, um, you know, in food processing plants, if the line has to go that fast for some ungodly reason, the line will go that fast. Um, you know, there was, there was, there was a lot of no exceptions um, to the way a lot of low wage and dangerous work happened. And I think people are unaware of, you know, we think of that all these workplaces had sneeze guards and blinders and people built all these protections in and people got increased unemployment insurance. And a lot of jobs had none of that. And they faced, you know, their, their lives and their, their, and their death down at work. And, uh, that's not heroism. That's like being sacrificed. And so I think, you know, we should really, I hope that we've learned a little bit about, about the difference. I hope so too. Um, and, and there have, there have been very, some encouraging signs in terms of worker solidarity that I do want to discuss with you, uh, at some uh, later point in the interview, but you also talk about how the essential working class disproportionately, 
men and women of color and how that played out alongside the Black Lives Matter movement and a wider reckoning about racism in the United States, systemic racism. Um, and in many ways, that's a bit that's an improvement in terms of the labor explosion of the 20th century where it was very white um in terms of like the 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 dominant unions uh and the recognition that 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 those workers got versus now so th there there's a difference in terms of those things playing out alongside of each other can you talk about how the, those came together yeah so one of the most important parts of the pandemic um labor labor wise as you said was the ability of workplace organizing and community organizing or political organizing to sort of cross pollinate each other. So, you know, many people from the, including Chris Smalls from the Amazon labor union were leaders of, in the essential worker movement and were black, are black and are leaders in black lives matter. And so that mattered a lot. Um, and then the essential working class is just disproportionately black and brown and female. And so the, the racism, the sort of systemic racism and the interpersonal racism that workers faced at work um, had natural spillover um, consequences for um, the Black Lives Matter movement. The other thing that's interesting there is that Black Lives Matter began to talk about, you know, the strike for black lives. And they began to really use the language of labor in a way that we hadn't seen before to some extent. And so the labor movement, you know, um, began to be to some extent led um, by these undercurrents of workers who were really coming up from below. And again, many of whom were black and many of whom were, were female, many of whom did not have, were not even represented by labor unions. You know, a third of the strikes in 2020 were led by workers without unions. That doesn't happen like in normal times. Like workers just don't walk off the job mm. or sit in or, or, or strike without without an organization. So it was a pretty anomalous situation, but I think some of that energy has carried over and has continued to you know, um, help build the Amazon movement, the Starbucks movement, some of the stuff happening among in higher ed, stuff like that. I mean, when they write about this time, right? Beginning with JFK 8 and, and Chris Smalls, the, it's it's that was the spark of the pandemic and the open disregard yeah. for people's health and their um and their lives that just it's it's there was so much bubbling up but that was really like a breaking point and, and you, you you talk about this in the book as in terms of like how, how workers need to can make gains when they create uh crises for for capitalism and um the the it, it's almost kind of an inversion of the the shock doctrine to a mm. degree where it's it that usually when there's moments of crisis that's when the military industrial complex or uh right. b big corporations see opportunities and and there was a lot of that pa mm -hmm. pandemic profiteering mm -hmm. real thing and just mm -hmm. look into those loan uh, those uh ppp loans as well but um but there was some of this too, and that's encouraging. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, you talk about the early days. Like I interviewed Chris in 2020, a couple months after he was laid off, and he's like, "We're not going to stop till we get unions at Amazon." And my first thought was, "Well, we're not going to get unions at Amazon, you know? Like we're, we're not we're not going to get it in good times. We're certainly not going to get it now." And then and then they won, and um, you know, people began to think about workplace organizing in very different ways, I think. If you look at the official statistics for 2020, like the number of large strikes collected by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there's nothing. There's eight strikes, four of which were led by nurses. And yet, and I saw these stats and I was like, oh, nothing's happening, really. That's weird. And then I start, when I would call people, they would say, oh, by the way, there was a walkout yesterday, or there was a protest yesterday, or we all want to form a union, or people are walking out on strike here and there, or there was a sit-in. And there was all this stuff bubbling up from below that was to some extent, you know, less the purview of the of labor officialdom. And I think one outcome of the pandemic is that workers really took matters into their own hands. It was hard for organizers and union staff to meet with people on the job 
during COVID. It was like sometimes illegal. So uh, you had, there was a new kind of effervescence um, mm. that bubbled up, which was really, really significant. And, and beyond what we've already discussed, I mean, there might have been an opportunity for some workers in, say, like the economic crash of 2008, maybe to make um, to, to 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 flex their muscle. But like the conditions just weren't necess- weren't right at that time. What what was so different, like, uh, you know, 12 years later, 13 years later? Yeah. Uh, that's a great question. I mean, you know, that that time after the Great Recession did give rise to Fight for 15, which originally was Fight for 15 and a union, which was at that time a utopian demand. Like, no, I could double the minimum wage at McDonald's. And, th- and then and then they did. Right. A lot, in, a, in a lot of places. And so that was a pretty momentous thing. There was some overlap between um, Occupy and the Fight for 15 especially in the unions where, you know, inequality was such a huge part of the, of their discourse or their, their reality. Um, but yeah, there wasn't the kind of explosion that we saw. There was an explosion in 2018, 2019 with the red for ed movement, but that was very siloed. Like it was basically copycat strikes in one industry. And Mm -hmm. during the pandemic, the essential working class was broad. Like, I mean, it is in, in to some extent still broad. And you had nurses making connections with, with delivery drivers and teachers and daycare providers in ways that we don't typically see. And so I think for that reason, early on, the strikes and protests and walkouts and disruptions were not siloed by one industry. They were not confined to one teachers or nurses or whatever. It was like pretty broad. And... Um, striketober was sort of an example of that. Like there was rolling strikes in a variety of different industries, big and small, and some with strong labor presences and some with almost none. And I think that variety was sort of a hallmark of pandemic labor organizing. Cr- cross industry solidarity uh, exactly. a- a- and a and an understanding that like you know we're all in this together. But that that that's that's so much easier to to create when you're all in it together and you have very, uh, you're, you're a nurse or you're a teacher or you're right. a minor. Um, but, but there was the share, there's the shared collective understanding that ca- a- an experience of being that essential worker under yeah. that huge umbrella that is just impossible to ignore. And, and it's clearly a driver here. Right. I mean, we typically think of class in America as a socioeconomic number. Right. It's like, oh, you make this much money and you work at, you know, a restaurant, you're a working class person or whatever. In reality, like there are masses of people out there who make X amount of money. And then there are classes like classes form. They form in action. And the pandemic working class like came into formation. And to some extent, it dissolved in out of formation. Right. Like at a certain point, um, the, the solidarity that held people together across those industries did begin to diminish. And it was undermined by you know a variety of factors. But there was a moment when a real frontline class formed based on people's proximity to risk. Like, did you risk your life when you went to work? Then you're with us. And if you didn't, then you're not. And you know, vaccines, unemployment insurance, the changing winds of the pandemic, all those things impacted that calculus and that risk factor. But early on, that proximity to risk was a real driver of working class consciousness. It, it, it's, it, it's so well said. Um, and, and in, I think, chapter four of you, your book, you talk ab- about how unions in general, and you emphasize the point of how much... Th- the, the impact that they have on workplace safety in mm-hmm. general. Um, if we could zoom out for a second, just looking at unions and how important they are. And we've we've tried to highlight at least once a week on this program uh, uh, some sort of like organizing that's happening. And um, but but just to to hammer that point home for people, how do unions protect you in your workplace? Yep. So we typically think of workplace safety 
as a, as a factor of like macroeconomic policy. In other words, if you have a bad job, um, you can quit it. And that incentivizes your boss to make the workplace better, to make the job better. The other possibility is that OSHA or some other institution will safeguard your workplace. And so we typically, you know, refer to workplace safety as a matter and outcome of one of those two factors. In my book, it's different. Um, and actually during the pandemic, it was different. <laughs> so um, like workers kept themselves safe and they kept the rest of us safe. So unions have always been um, guarantors of like workplace safety. They're associated with um, lower rates of disease. They're so associated with you know making more money so you can afford better care, better you know preemptive care, so to speak. Um, they're associated with lower hours. Uh, longer hours is a huge contributor to to poor health. And working and union members have better health insurance. So all those factors are always true. During the pandemic, I worked with a team of researchers to study a couple different industries. So the most important one probably was nursing homes, uh, which was the epicenter of the of the virus for the first you know year and a half. Um, if you had a union in your nursing home, residents there were about ten percent less likely to die of COVID than if there was no union. Uh, um, workers were about eight percent less likely to be infected. By the virus if they had a union you know and partially in other words like those are real material things you know mm -hmm. like we're talking fewer deaths so in other words if you if you extrapolate those numbers out and imagine the entire industry being unionized that saves about eight thousand excess deaths and all those people have family friends and loved ones who that effect ripples out to um the reason was to some extent simple, like workers have a voice on the job and workers can, um, they have better access to PPE. Like throughout the pandemic, unionized workers have better access to masks and gloves and eye shields and gowns. I talked to nursing home workers who were using like umbrellas and old raincoats, like for PPE you know, with, without a union. That stuff was not common when you had protection. Um, so nursing home workers, you know, went on went on strike, did walkouts, um, held protests, and those things, um, you know, build up your your power, build up your voice on the job, and it makes a big difference. And so, it's no shock that in terms of where labor stood, they from from an organizing perspective, it was let's take COVID seriously as opposed to the management or the boss position of getting back to normal. Yes, exactly. Like, you know, unions had a real incentive to to do right by their members in, in a lot of ways, you know, because if you're in a if you're a low wage healthcare worker, like I, I interviewed tons of nursing home aides and they made their wages were so low that they would have to work at two or three different nursing homes to make a living during the, what that meant during the pandemic was that you spread covid. Right. Like among among the very patients that you were helping to keep alive. And everyone said this. Everyone's like, I know like that I am contributing to this pan this virus spreading. Okay. And yet I'm the only one here <laughs> that can save us you know, to some extent. And if you but if you have if you make three or four dollars more an hour, um, you know, that actually translates into, well, maybe I don't have to work two jobs. Right. Like um uh, those kind of things make, you know, if I have employer paid health insurance, I don't have to work longer hours just to get health insurance, which means like, you know, I can have break times. I can have rest times. I can sleep better. I can take care of myself. And really, you know, a major theme throughout the book is the working conditions of essential workers are the living conditions of the rest of us. Like we're all better off if we're all better off. And we want those people you know, working nursing home jobs to make $30 an hour and to have like full, you know, like nursing aides were excluded from the CARES Act, like protections under the CARES Act. Um, like we relied on them to save people and then we left them to die. And it's really, uh, it's a shocking, you know, it's a shocking fact about how we treat the people at the, at the bottom. So you can consider work, the working class people as either the bottom 
or a foundation of democracy. And those are two very different things. They sort of sound like the same word, but they're but they're very different. Yes. Um, and uh, before uh, we, I let you go, I, I wanted to talk to you about the uh, discussion about work a worker shortage uh, that we're experiencing right now in the U.S. Um, what's your take on how <laughs> that has been framed uh, by governmental officials, elected officials, media, etc., uh, in contrast to the reality of what it actually means? We just have a surplus of bad jobs. That's basically what the American economy is. Like for the last 20 years, we have hollowed out middle paying, decent jobs. And we've added far more jobs at the bottom of the income ladder. And as jobs have gotten worse, like healthcare protections have gotten worse. And as healthcare protections have gotten worse, like people's safety have gotten worse. Like it's really like, a, I don't know what the metaphor is, a Domino's thing or something. And so we have a surplus of bad jobs. During the pandemic, you know, during the height of the pandemic, the labor shortage was actually not that confusing. Like the census asks everyone, why, why weren't you working last week? And you can just read that data. And it says that people were caring for loved ones or themselves or children who were sick with COVID. That's basically what happened for 18 months. And um, we still have a crisis of care. Like daycare centers closed and never reopened. Um, child care providers shut down. Like there's still fam you know, millions of families who can't work because they can't find care for their kids, elderly, what have you. You know, people took families out of nursing homes and care for them, are caring for them more by themselves now um, because those places were so dangerous. So I think we're still seeing like the, 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 the care crisis as driving to some extent the labor shortage. The other thing is, is that, you know, people, that's one explanation. The other one really is that people did become just completely fed up with dead end work. Um, granted, tons of people are still doing it, but I think there are fewer and fewer people who are looking for it. And, you know, some, some industries that basically have bad jobs, like restaurants, like restaurants are not coming back the way they were four years ago. We're not going to have as many. And we just have to live with that fact because the jobs, you know, working in the kitchen or the front of the house at most restaurants is a pretty um, demeaning and demoralizing $2.35 an hour job. And we just, you know, we should have less of them. And I think a, lar a large people, a large amount of people are beginning to realize that. I mean, and it is the, you can also trace that back to outsourcing, um, globalization, the United States Fishering, right. becoming a service economy uh, largely. And and so it just takes one shock, like the coronavirus pandemic, for that house of cards to begin to, to, to right. tip over. Right, right. Well, American employers are like addicted to low wage service jobs. And we have to break that addiction. Like there's nothing inherently bad about service work. You know, we think of those like menial minimum wage sort of cashier type, you know, jobs as being inherently bad. We once thought about that about industrial, industrial, the industrial working class jobs, which bloomed the middle class in the middle of the 20th century. Um, those jobs were made better. They were made better by organizing and policy and unions and service sector jobs can be good too. And I think, you know, if we have a service economy, there's no reason it has to be inferior to an economy dominated by middle class manufacturing. We just right now, like the priority to do that is not there. I mean, Biden came in guns blazing. Um, I'm the next pro union or I'm the biggest pro union president since, I don't know, Lincoln or something. And we that evaporated pretty quick, you yeah. know, and we, and some of that has to you know, has to apply pressure on him to to bring back some of those uh, promises. 100%. Well, uh, can't thank you enough, Jamie McCallum. The book is entitled Essential, How the Pandemic Transformed the Long Fight for Worker Justice. And, and Jamie has uh, a few other books that you can also check out as well. Um, and I know you, you can check out his writing in a bunch of different places. Mother Jones, I saw Descent, right? Uh, some mm -hmm. other magazines that we like over here at the Majority Report. 
Thanks so much, Jamie. Really appreciate your time. Thanks, Emma. Of course. All right, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll be joined by Garrett Bruhog. <laughs> We are back and we are joined now by Garrett Bruhog, a PhD candidate at the University of Rochester, and he is here to explain the latest breakthrough in fusion energy and what it really means. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much for coming on today. Yeah, happy to come on and explain it. Um, thanks. For, yeah. I guess, where do you want me to jump in? <laughs> so I, I was explaining to him briefly while we were uh, setting up his shot. I'm a, I am a science philistine in many respects. When I when I read about this, I was incredibly excited. Right where like the mainstream media reports on on the uh, this fusion reaction were were glowing. Um, government scientists have achieved this this massive breakthrough. Can can you explain what that means for our audience, and then we can go through kind of some of the more practical realities. Yeah, so I guess going all the way back, nuclear fusion is one of the two big nuclear reactions that we can use to get energy. Fission is what we use right now in reactors. It's where we split something heavy like uranium. Uh, my lights are actually currently being kept on by a fission reactor, so I'm glad that works. Uh, fusion is what we would like to uh, have in the future, um, and maybe for like space and things like that. It's what powers the sun. Uh, and it's also what powers hydrogen bombs, which is part of the impetus for research on it. Um, what happened at Lawrence Livermore National Labs last week is they achieved what we call ignition. You can argue they actually did it last year, but this year was the real uh, official uh, set point. There was there's what us scientists would consider, and there's what the government set as a solid bar to make sure that there was no uh, games being played. And you can think of it like this. Uh, imagine we have a, like a bonfire we want to light, right? And we have some sort of new kind of super clean burning wood that we want to use. And we know from our, our young and youthful and crazy days setting off nuclear bombs that if we use a flamethrower, we can light the bonfire. But that's not really useful. That's, that's dangerous and bad. <laughs> the goal was to figure out how to light just a little bit of it in a very controlled fashion. And what we did last week was show that we could get a little bit of it to burn with more energy, to release more energy than it took to actually light it. And we've been working on this for 60 years. The fuel was able to self-heat. Now, it did not actually make more energy than was totally put into the system. The electricity to charge the lasers was far more than the energy that the fusion uh, reaction put out. But the fusion reaction put out more energy than the lasers put in. And that's what we really care about for understanding the physics. We've never done that outside of the nuclear weapon before. And it is huge to be able to do it inside of the lab. It allows us to study what actually happens in an ignited plasma, which is a really big deal for making any kind of fusion reactor. But we also know from our crazy youthful days that you can scale this up quite quickly. So just, you know, once you get a little bit of wood burning, you know, you can get a lot of wood burning uh, without too much more effort. It was just figuring out how to light it. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how surprising was this breakthrough? What had this, I mean, you talk about how they've been working on this since, um, for decades, since what, the 1950s on, on, on fusion. Uh, and, and they finally had this this massive breakthrough. But in terms of how this was building, was this expected or uh, surprising? So it was both surprising and expected. And I'll, I'll explain why I use those two terms. Uh, the facility where this happened, the National Ignition Facility, you'll notice the ignition is in the name. They got that funded and it was proposed that we understood fusion so well from all of our nuclear weapons testing that we could just build this big laser and it was just going to work. That There were claims when they were getting this thing built uh, back in like the early 2000s 
the very first shot was going to make so much fusion, it would damage the facility. And it, it was going to be just the most beautiful and amazing scientific achievement. Well, they started up in 2008, I want to say. And you'll notice they didn't get it. <laughs> and it's been many years, many very embarrassing years of having a facility called the National Ignition Facility with no ignited plasma. Now, this most recent shot was, it was expected that we were going to get something like this soon. Because last year in August, we had a surprise shot that got so much more yield than we were expecting. It did actually cause some damage. It did not pass the government threshold for ignition, but all of us in the field were like, oh my God, we did it. We're, we know how to go from here. Um, so it was kind of just a matter of time. And an important thing to keep in mind is that the National Ignition Facility takes a really long time to set up all these experiments. So we're not, it's not like we're shooting these pellets once every minute and be like, why aren't they lighting? Why aren't they lighting? There's maybe 10 really high yield fusion experiments per year. The laser is used for other things. It's, uh, it's used for national security related applications and it's also used for pure science. There's a lot of really amazing studies of things like white dwarfs and centers of planets and cool like astrophysics and all of that takes time where they could be doing fusion. So the fact that they went from nothing, almost no fusion yield at all to getting up, 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 getting a surprise shot and then this uh, ignition moment it is a pretty impressive feat. It was over the course of, I think, 300 times they pulled the trigger on a fusion shot. It's it's pretty pretty few to be iterating. Now, um, the this kind this laser or this technology, I guess, uh, at the at the NIF, um, I, I saw in your Twitter thread on this that there there's it's a bit outdated to a degree. And there's going to be an issue potentially now, especially with the Republicans taking the House, uh, with maybe getting some funding to capitalize on some of this technological achievement. Where is it a little? Where is it behind where it should be to continue some of the 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 experimentation that you describe? So all big science machines tend to be surprisingly old in terms of the technology used. We have to pick what is um, safe at the time, right? You have to pick a technology that you trust you can build this multi-billion dollar machine uh, taking taxpayer money and that it will actually work. So NIF, the, the NIF was commissioned in 1992 to begin construction. So they are decided to use laser technology from say 1982. So this is before we even get, you know, uh, Ronnie Ray guns, Star Wars program pushing lasers forward. Um, we had better laser technology at smaller scale. No one was going to fund it for, for the NIF. The point was just to make the darn thing work. It didn't matter how inefficient and bad it was. It would it just need to put lasers on target. We've had many decades of wonderful advancement. Uh, both on civilian and military sides, and also um, for fusion applications, the lasers are looking a lot better. The que like you said, though, the question is going to be funding to actually get a new facility built. There's already serious talk of proposals of new facilities where I'm at in Rochester, where we have the little sister to the NIF, um, as well as facilities moving past the National Ignition Facility. I actually think we are in a better boat than you would expect politically. And that's because the NIF is connected to military applications as well because of stockpile mm. stewardship. You can usually convince the Republicans to jump on board for that sort of stuff. Um, you just kind of wave your hands and say military and then they will, <laughs> you, know, you can get you can get your money for whatever science you want to do. We, it happened during the Reagan era. There was a lot of this will totally defend us from the Soviets and it, it wasn't it was worthless for that. Um, but it's all about playing the, the smart political games and fusion is hot right now. We've got, you mm. know, there's, there's talk of clean energy. There's talk of an energy crisis and everyone wants to push forward on it. So I, I think, I think we are liable to get new facilities that can really build off of it. Timelines are always the question and, you know, who knows, maybe someone, someone like, um, uh, what's his face, Ted Cruz or whatever does a poison pill. Who knows? Let's hope not, um, because, uh, yeah, all we just have to say is military, as you say, but don't say it too loud because then it's, it's given it away. Um, so, uh, but I'm wondering if you could expand a bit more on the uh, 
the 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 reason that this if it's able to be advanced this kind of technology would be so beneficial for uh moving towards a future where our energy systems are not contributing to say the destruction of the planet um the the uh, amount of or, or i guess this is a really just to um, move away from carbon uh, uh, carbon intensive energy, right? Um, what is the what does it really mean in terms of our fight uh, to reduce the effects of climate change? So my honest opinion on it is that fusion is probably not hitting at the time frame we we really need, I mean, it's one of those things we should always be pushing new technologies forward. We want to have new stuff coming online as much as possible, but we also need to be deploying things now. So you kind of have to weigh that mix. Now, of course, the amount of money going into fusion research really is nothing compared to, uh, say, the IRA um, bill. Where the, the NIF was built over budget at $3.5 billion over the course of 15 years. That's a drop in the bucket. Um, and, and we could build newer facilities in that sort of time frame. Fusion is completely carbon free. So that's very nice. Uh, it has, it's basically got all of the attributes of nuclear fission power. It's just a different way of getting nuclear energy. It's going to take a while to get reactors that make uh, net electricity. And then if you read up on the history of say how we got fission reactors to where they are now, it's going to take a while to get them to be reliable and cheap and things that we that we can really um, use to, to plug uh, big parts of our power so power usage. Um, but if you don't start now, you'll never get there. And right. it's, it, it is a really compelling way forward. Um, and it's, it's one of those beautiful things that the, even though it technically burns fuel, the fuel that's burnt, I mean, I got enough in my glass of water to already power this, the city I'm living in for many, many years. It's uh, it, it's, it's a wonderful future energy source. And so it's definitely something, especially because we have this um, this big advancement and then broadly in the United States, kind of a lead in fusion technology, we shouldn't give up on it, even if it's not going to come onto the grid next year. Uh, what is the waste that would be produced by this process? Um, broadly, the waste issue would come down to activated materials. So fusion makes a lot more neutron radiation than fission and it will make the walls of the reactor radioactive. Uh, this is an issue that we already deal with with medical waste and with fission uh, reactors. It's a known problem, um, just like handling, and, and just like handling waste from a fission reactor, it's an incredibly small amount of t material, all things considered. You'd look at a fusion reactor and say, wow, that's huge. But then you consider how much energy it made. Uh, it's a minuscule amount of waste. We're already working on how you would recycle it. And it would be um, dangerous for less time than fission waste. Although, you know, you can recycle fission waste and make that not an issue either. It's kind of, it's one of those things that if you put the regulatory bodies in place and the correct incentives, it's not even a problem. Oh, I'm praying that this continues to be in the government's hands and there isn't like some sort of like a private push. I mean, would that even be possible uh, it, it, currently for, for there is, would, would that worry you? Yeah. So there is a big private push right now on fusion. That's where a lot of the money is coming in. Um, the exciting part is a lot of these companies are pushing ideas. The, the government has to kind of just pick a couple safe concepts and push them forward because you're using taxpayer money. Um, these companies are, more likely to go for some wild concepts that might might pay off. I can't say if they're going to work. Who knows? I, I think it's great if they keep taking, say, Jeff Bezos's money and playing with it. You know, I'm sure it's I'm sure it's a lot of fun. Um, I'm not that worried about any sort of safety concerns, though. The Nuclear Regulatory Commission is fame, which is the, the people that regulate all of this. They're famously harsh in the United States. Um, we have very, very well regulated uh, nuclear activities already. And I don't think there would be any risk when it comes to fusion. Um, the NRC will prevent any uh, issues to the to the public. Good. Well, at least it, in its current iteration, right? Unless this begins to explode and then there's maybe some 
deregulatory push, but uh, we we can cross that bridge when when we come to it. Um, does does that does when you when you talk about fission uh, um, technology, is that what a lot of the uh, old climate models for a transition to nuclear are based on, and does that make um, fission more outdated now that we have these new gains in fusion? So that's basically what every climate model talking about using nuclear would would assume, um, because we we hadn't even hit ignition, so no one knew when fusion would come online. We're still a long ways from a power plant, and so all of those climate models assuming fission are very very um, on point. And there is no guarantee a fusion power plant or any near-term one is at all um, competitive. And I don't mean in a market-based sense, but in like making cheap, reliable power for, for everyone. Uh, current fission reactors are already really good. The, the ones that we want and are building are even better. And uh, I, I would very much push people, even though this is, this is an amazing thing to be excited about, it's awesome that we hit this point and we should keep pushing forward on fusion. In no way should we give up on fission. We should push fission forward. We should push the you know the accelerator to the max because it is a proven way to decarbonize huge chunks of of economies, as seen with France and Ontario. All right. Well, um, that was so helpful, and I really appreciate you coming on, uh, Garrett Bruhog, PhD candidate, at University of Rochester. You got a Twitter thread where you go into this and uh, people can check out your your page. We'll put a link to it in our description for the podcast. Uh, Garrett, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me on. It was a lot of fun. It was great. Thank you. All right, folks, with that, we are going to wrap up the first hour of this program. We're going to head into the fun half where we will be reading your IMs and taking your calls. But first, Matt, how was Left Reckoning last night? What should uh, how should people check it out? Oh, gosh. Uh, well, we had Mike Racine on, comedian Mike Racine, to talk about uh, this whole thing about how comedy is, is going to the right. Mm. And uh, everyone, uh, all the good comedians, uh, such as Matt Walsh and Kara Dansky, are all uh, on the right wing now because of trans people um, basically not making comedy uh, uh, safe on the left. Uh, we talked about that uh, and some Twitter stuff and uh, Peru. And uh, I went deep into the JFK, the recent JFK stuff about the confirmation that Lee Harvey Oswald was a CIA asset and that the CIA covered up uh, what they knew about Oswald uh, for years and years and years until basically uh, we were all children. And I did not see this confirmation. How did this come this out? Is, this is what uh, Jefferson Morley was talking about recently, basically. Um, the CIA sources and methods uh, regarding... Uh, a bunch of things. Um, first of all, what they knew and how closely they were tracking Lee Harvey Oswald prior to the assassination, uh, and how they targeted the Fair Play for Cuba committee for COINTELPRO uh, infiltration. Uh, uh, Fair Play for for Cuba committee had, uh, coincidentally, maybe or because of that, uh, Lee Harvey Oswald for a member, where he was hmm. ostentatiously being a communist in New Orleans, and somehow found a right-wing uh, radio outlet to give a interview uh for so um anyway you gave we got, an interview on the radio yeah there's a like a there's a long interview you can get probably full thing on youtube if you search lee harvey oswald radio interview in new orleans and it's like he's all like i, I can't i haven't listened to it in a while but it's all like i'm a marxist leninist and you know uh it, it's very clearly my opinion uh, a CIA guy trying to make himself look like a communist um, and infiltrate. Stuff. I mean, I always thought that that was like I implied, but now with n if there's new morally revelations, making it a little bit more concrete, that's yeah. very exciting. And just what we know for certain is that when the Warren Commission came out, the CIA said, "Yeah, I didn't know nothing about that guy," mm. and they were that was a lie. Uh, yeah. So whether uh, folks want to say maybe it was it was true he was in CIA but that didn't really have anything to do with his actions later and he was still a lone gunman CIA still lied about that buddy and Why? we still haven't we still haven't like had a real <laughs> accounting for how the CIA could lie about that and I'll just make one final note so we can get the fun half but um a month to the day of Kennedy being assassinated Harry S Truman. Uh, was in the Washington Post saying, hey, uh, we should maybe look at getting rid of the CIA because 
uh, it's gotten outside of its purview a little bit, and that could lead to some um, uh, problems, and uh, it may have gotten out of hand. So let's take a look at that. And uh, of course, we didn't listen to him, and the CIA is still around and uh, and still laundering itself, as, even as we learn all this stuff. And also, the FBI is still hiding documents too. So it's and all the stuff about the deep state from the right and Nothing. it doesn't seem like those folks are super interested um in, and also we should note trump uh could have released all this stuff under his watch and Buried he did not it. uh biden is uh is giving us some of it but he's also i think slow walking to, we need transparency on this stuff come on like <laughs> it's been a long time but yep. anyway yeah uh well, that's the I'm, that's fascinating. That was less of a plug out. and more of another segment. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I could go forever on that stuff. Um, on ESPN, uh, we spoke about a little bit about the World Cup match. Do we have? Is the match happening right now between France and Morocco, or is that at two p.m. again today? God, these middle of the day things. Um, but uh, Argentina has moved on at this point. Uh, but at 2 p.m. they're playing today. That'll be very exciting. We're going to have uh, our final two very soon. We spoke about that on ESPN. Also, I uh, gave a definitive victory lap on um, the fact that Justin Herbert has been, always will be, better than Tua. Uh, it's not really close. Tua is not that good, and uh, it was. It's he seems like a nice guy, but you can check out me taking that victory lap on the, on ESPN. Also, I spoke about how the Giants are not going to make the playoffs, but I think the Lions will, which is very exciting for Detroit. Uh, and more stuff, youtube.com slash ESPN show. Now, heading into the fun half, 646-257-3920. See you there. You right. are in for it. All right, folks, 646-257-3920. See you in the fun half. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Are you ready? Who sent us this? Alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, back. Just as delicious as you could imagine. The alpha males are back, 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 back. Boy is back. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. Just wanna degrade the white man. Alpha males are back, back. I take all of it in my throat. Alpha males are back. Snowflakes says what? The alpha males are back, 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 back. You are a madman! And the alpha males are back, back. Oh no, Sam Cedar, what a, whoa, what a fucking nightmare. What a fucking nightmare. nightmare. bring back DJ Yeah, or a couple of them, just put them in rotation. DJ Denner. Well, the problem with those is they're like 45 seconds long, so I don't know if they're enough for the break. That's fucking nonsense. See white people doing drugs that look worse than normal white people, and all white people look disgusting. And the alpha males are psych. Fuck them. Fuck them. Snowflake says what? 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 Hell of a lot of bank. Okay, I'm making stupid money. Hell of, hell, hell, <laughs> hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> a hell of a lot of bank. <laughs> All lives matter. <laughs> Have you tried doing an impression on a college campus? I, I think that there's no reason why reasonable people across the divide can't all agree with this. Psych. And the alpha males are back, 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 back. And the Africans are black, 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 black African. And the alpha males are black, 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 black. And the Africans are back, 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 back. When you see Donald Trump out there, doesn't a little party you think that America deserves to be taken over by jihadists? Keep it at 100. Can't knock the hustle. Come on. Fuck them. Fuck them. Things I do for the bigger game plan. By the way, it's my birthday. It's my birthday. birthday. Happy birthday to me, Jew boy. I have a thought experiment for you. And the alpha males are back. Back. Africans are black. Black. Alpha males are black. Black. Africans are black. Black. Come on. <laughs> what? Come on. Someone needs to pay the price of blasphemy around here. I, 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 I am a total...
We are back. We are back, and I am turning off the voicemail and opening up the phone lines. Um, going to read some IMs, then we'll do some clips. Giddy Up says, Our octogenarian leadership is useless for our times. The fusion ignition announcement was so ho-hum. Jennifer Granholm making BFD jokes. Zero this is an opportunity, uh, is opportunity to do. I didn't see. She was made, oh, like, referencing Biden saying that about Obamacare. <laughs> um... Your mic's not on. <laughs> Go ahead. I put it down when I eat, so it's not so it doesn't, doesn't pick up on the mic. Okay. But um, uh, Granholm was it's just Granholm was like the the former the governor of Michigan like twelve years ago. Right. Like it just like this the the bench the bench is so deep in terms of like <laughs> experience for some of these cabinet members. Experience is a nice word yeah. for it. Yeah. <laughs> they're like they're like backbenching vets on yeah. like a, like a Lakers team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it right exactly. Um, no one does anything particularly well here, though, but, um, DNC Google pundit, what a blatant show of weakness from the Biden administration. It's somewhat understandable not wanting to potentially disrupt gas prices a few months for, from before the midterms, MBS, then cut production anyway. But the next election is two years away, so the time to stand up to Saudi Arabia is now. This is just a huge signal to Saudi Arabia that Biden will cave every time on anything. A huge mistake. Yeah. And it's like... Did they think they could get away with whipping votes in private?